Now this we have to talk about a little bit more because the law of independent assortment doesn't always hold. Mm -hmm. What was the key assumption that I made in order to show why these alleles should, should assort independently of each other? Yeah, what would it mean if they were linked? How, how would they be linked physically? Uh, they would be on the same gene. Close. They are genes. Oh, they, they, would be on, they would be on the same chromosome. Okay. Remember, a chromosome is a collection of a whole bunch of genes. Yeah. This is a gene, this is a gene, this is a gene, and this is a gene. Well, the key assumption I made was that these were all on separate chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So if this chromosome physically moved into this gamete, that wouldn't tell you anything about whether this chromosome physically moved onto the gamete. Mm -hmm. But let's suppose... Let's suppose that the gene for um, your pod type happened to be on the same chromosome as the gene for your leaf type. Well now, let's say that the gamete gets a capital L. What are the odds that it would get a capital P? 100%. And what are the odds of a lowercase p? Zero. So now there would only be two types of gametes. You'd have a 50% chance of getting this and a 50% chance of getting this. And the Punnett square would be much simpler now. Now there would only be two rows and two columns if these were both um, on the same chromosome. So you only have independent assortment when genes are on separate chromosomes. If they're on the same uh, chromosome, you have very dependent assortment. Now remember that these are laws that Mendel came up with when he was originally doing his experiments. He came up with segregation independent assortment. Um, so Mendel turned out to be very lucky because all the traits that he happened to pick happened to be on separate chromosomes. Mm -hmm. If they had happened to be on the same chromosome, his results would have come out much more complicated and he wouldn't have been able to get such uh, simple answers. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he was very unlucky also because no one ever paid any attention to him until after he was dead. <laughs> but he was lucky in the sense that he happened to pick traits that would follow the law of independent assortment because they happened to be on separate chromosomes. So the law of independent assortment isn't always followed. It's even more complicated than that because um, if traits are on the same chromosome, they don't always move together because there can be crossing over. Right. There can be crossing over. So basically when you're doing normal Mendelian genetics, you just assume that each trait is on a separate chromosome because when the traits are on the same chromosome, things are much more complicated. Um, if they're very close to each other on the same chromosome, they almost always move together. But if they're very far from each other on the chromosome, then sometimes they stay together and sometimes there's crossing over and they separate. And that's much more complicated. So you wouldn't be asked as complicated questions about that. So um, all the traits that Mendel focused on, they were either on separate chromosomes or maybe they were on the same chromosome, but they were so far apart from each other that they almost always, that there was a, lot, there was a, a very high chance of crossing over. So they acted like they were independently assorted. By the way, there's no law that says that the two dominant genes have to be on the same chromosome. I just happened to write it that way. It's, it's totally possible that you could have a dominant with a recessive and a recessive with a dominant. Of course, each chromosome actually has more than just two alleles. It has thousands or millions, I don't know, many different alleles, but we're just focusing on one or two. Okay, okay so the law of independent assortment is actually pretty important, and it has to do with whether the traits are on the same chromosome or not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, and in terms of crossing over, yeah. I know that the probability is more likely that crossing over will occur when they're farther apart as and you can think of crossing over as just like the chromosome gets cut um, and then the pieces exchange at the cuts. Well, obviously, a cut is much more likely to happen between two genes if there's space between the genes. If the genes are right next to each other, there's, room, there's no room for the, for the chromosome to be cut between them. I'm sorry, you were saying? So. Oh, so I was just going to say, so does the probability of crossing over increase like infinitely as they get farther and farther apart? Or like once they're way too far apart, crossing over wouldn't... That's a good question. The, basically, um, the highest possibility of crossing over is about 50%. Oh, okay. And it's true, uh, this is something that your, your textbook talks about at one point. Uh, so there comes a point when genes are so far apart that crossing over happens 50% of the time. And then it doesn't matter whether, you, and then if you make them even further apart, they're still only gonna cross over about 50% of the time. And notice that that would be, that would give you the same results as if they were on different chromosomes. That means, if they're so far apart that crossing over happens 50% of the time, that means that 50% of the time they end up in the same gametes, and 50% of the time they end up in separate gametes. Like well, that's the exact. Over here. 
Yeah, yeah. that's the same exact results you would have gotten if they were on separate chromosomes in the first place. Yeah. With separate chromosomes, the two genes end up in the same gamete 50% of the time and separate gametes 50% 50 of the time. So um, I don't know if this is exact or approximate, but I think that the, approximately the highest chance of crossing over you can have is 50% when genes are pretty far apart from each other. Uh, and if they're even further apart than that, it still remains 50%. Okay, that was a lot of mm -hmm. um, And then my only other question, so those big planets there, yeah. and when they're on, they're not on the same chromosome, um, in lieu of doing a big, you can just right. multiply the probabilities. It's so faster just, if you're, if, you're, if you're good enough at probability and statistics, you can just use math to work out what the probability is of any particular genotype. That's right. I was kind of doing that when I was working with these probabilities here. I was talking about what's the probability of each of these different types of gametes coming together. That's right. If you have time during this test, maybe it's good to do a problem both ways, both yeah. by math and with the Punnett square to make sure you're getting the same answer. Okay.